This is Ian Gordon, and you're listening to Monsters, Madness, and Magic. Mr. Gordon, uh, take us back in time. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? I think I'm probably going to play that one safe. I was more of a book reader than anything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, safely tucked away in a bedroom somewhere, you know, um, probably with a, a Stephen King's latest book in my hand back in the back in the early nineties. Mm. I was just getting into all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that that was uh, my childhood one hundred and one, um, rifling through the libraries to find copies of short story collections and things like that. And whereabouts did you grow up? Um, I'm actually from a, well, I'm in Manchester at the moment, but I lived um, and grew up in a small town called West Horton. Mm. It's actually the uh, the birthplace of Robert Shaw, the actor as well, who uh, appeared in Jaws. So that's right. uh, that's the town's claim to fame. Um, in shadow of the Moors, the West Pennines. Quite a dramatic spot, but, you know, quite a quiet spot as well, really. Um, just outside Manchester, as I say. That's a uh, that's quite a claim to fame because you know the the Indianapolis speech is one of the the best scenes in film history. It is, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. a good speech. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> worth watching the movie for just that scene alone. It is. It gives me chills. You know, just thinking about it. Yeah, what what an actor he was. Yeah, so I don't did, think he um he stayed in West Orton very long. I think he uh, he was out of there as soon as he got an opportunity. But um, yeah, it served him well in the end. I think. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So were either your parents uh, big readers or were they involved in the literary field in some capacity? No, not really. Um, I had two older brothers. Um, my eldest brother's 16 years older than me. And the one in between is 14 years older than me. Um, so they, they were probably the, the first kind of artistic influences that I had in my life, both musicians. Mm. And although my mother was a big reader, um, and play the piano as well. Um, I did pick up a heck, heck of a lot more from my my brothers, really, on a, an artistic front. And being, you know, such a large age difference as well, I think that um, it was easier to see those as, as kind of almost parental figures as well, rather than siblings. Mm. So yeah, lots of influences coming from different areas, really. Now, did you ever pick up any instruments or anything like that? Did the mm. music gene touch you? Yeah, that music was the um, was my first uh, passion, really, more so than uh, than literature, really, in the early days, because it went from one thing to the other. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, with older brothers, you tend to gravitate towards whatever they're doing. So, um, picked up a few instruments in my youth: guitars, keyboards, and uh, was in a few bands for a while as well in my early twenties, late twenties as well. Um, which kind of led to this, really. Really? Um, to, to get into the voice work. who we was quite a theatrical performer back in the day. You know, I always liked that uh, kind of world between um, theatre and rock, you know, and somewhere in between. since all the big progressive rock bands growing up. So I liked all that story meets music stuff, which, of course, resulted in the... Uh, and the love of writing and obviously the, the voice acting in the end. Now, did you attend the stage as a fan a, a lot? Um, not, not a tremendous amount. Hmm. A lot of the groups that um, I liked when I was growing up had already been and gone, if you know what I mean. Had uh, either retired or given up altogether. Dead is the other one, isn't <laughs> it? A lot of those uh, classic artists are long gone in that capacity. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the the occasional band that would come through to Manchester, I would I would check out. You know, you Iron Maidens and uh, White Snakes, all, all the uh, the classic rock guys and the heavy metal guys. Oh yeah, Maiden's still the best concert I've seen to this day, and they were really yeah. That was uh, that wasn't that long ago. It was in the last uh, six seven years. Old guys still doing what they do, you know. Yeah, they they just seem to kind of like a fine wine. They just get yeah. better with age, I think. Yeah, they're timeless. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I met Bruce actually when I was thirteen years old. He he, uh, he came to Bolton, which is the, the the main town near where I grew up, and he he did an acoustic show. So I was right up close and met him. Uh, that was quite quite an inspirational moment. Quite quite a nice guy. 
to entertain a 13 year old fan, you know? Yeah, I'll say. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when you think about the formative films and TV shows, what comes to mind that you grew up on? Um, yeah, in the early days, I was a big Hammer Horror fan. Again, I think that uh, came through from my brothers. So I used to watch all the old uh, anthology movies, um, Tales from the Crypt, Dr. Tara's House of Horrors, Asylum, just to name a few. Um, which I later discovered um, growing up that uh, a lot of these segments were written by, you know, your weird fiction authors like Robert Block. Um, so I was always into that stuff, probably more so than your standalone movies. And and then I kind of got into the uh, slasher phase, you know, with your Friday the 13th and your Halloweens and um, Friday, Nightmare on Elm Street not, and did, did the whole... Well, how many movies are there in those series? It gets gets a bit ridiculous. Ten plus. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved that stuff as a teenager. I kind of bonded quite well with the love of uh, metal and heavy rock, you know. So um, not not much in terms of plot, but, you know, visually and all the rest of it, I thought it was very entertaining indeed. But, um, yeah, I don't suppose there was anything I shied away from, but... Um, I did like the uh, older cinema, really. I was much more of a fan of the, the anthologies and your, your, your classic the Hitchcock movies, Psycho and The Birds and things like mm. that. Awesome. So, uh, Ian, this is something I like to ask everyone because you never know someone's background. Uh, what scared you as a kid? Oh, right. Well, this is another subject in itself. I think... Um, a lot of people growing up in my neck of the woods had the the resident ghost. You know, we, we had one at home and we even gave the this this ghost a name. Um, and after a while, I thought I thought, you know, that my brothers and my my parents were taking the mickey a little bit. But after a while, I started to hear things, see things. And, and after a while, that started to seep into my uh, into my blood, I think. And every night I would creep upstairs, you know, expecting to bump into this old man that allegedly died in my bedroom. So, yeah, there was some, I, I think the first realization where I thought this could actually be a real phenomenon. Yeah, I could actually bump into this man in the house. That, that I think that was the first idea that really disturbed me. Not that I ever saw a ghost in the house, but it was the, the notion that this character could be in the house as well as my mum and dad mm -hmm. that freaked me out. Um, it didn't stop me. It didn't deter me from reading horror books or watching horror movies, but um, I do remember having several sleepless nights at the idea of this this old chap in the house. <laughs> so how, how early on do you remember maybe experimenting with uh, writing your own shorts and such? Um, probably um, secondary school. Um, I, I was... If, if, if I can think of a time when I actually finished a project, um, it was a sort of uh, choose your own adventure thing that I did as a school project, which is inspired by some of the old uh, D and D style role playing games. I don't know if you remember uh, Hero Quest. Yes, I do. Does that ring a bell? Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, it's that that whole world. Yeah, I was, I was big into that as a, a teenager as well. So there was a. Yeah, choose your own adventure style story. And I, I thought that was um, quite an ambitious project to do for school. And it kind of I wouldn't like to reflect on it now, let's put it that way. But um, yeah, I think other than that, in my teenage years, I was much more into the composition of music. But I, you know, write stories to accompany the songs. But in terms of a finished written project, it would have been that at around the age of 13, 14. Um, Quest for Freedom, I think it was called. <laughs> um, again, I uh, I must dig that out at some point. See so just how bad it is. <laughs> so uh, I take it you were a D and D player growing up. Um, yeah, I never never really um, experimented with the you know the the hardcore true D and D uh, formats. I was always more comfortable with a a, um, a board game that had made life a bit easier for me. I didn't have to uh, use my imagination too much in that respect. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I always wanted to to dabble, but um, lots yeah, you're of still you're are, still young. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, that's a subjective view, isn't it? <laughs> so, what was your introduction to Lovecraft? Oh yeah, um, I think the very first time I came across Lovecraft was um, there was a game 
a video game on the, uh, I think it was on the Amiga in the early 90s called uh, Shadow of the Comet. And it was roughly based on the Call of Cthulhu. So as I was going through this this game as a child, I, I was kind of fascinated by this this concept. What is this this unpronounceable word? You know, <laughs> uh, where does that come from? And uh, through that, I managed to find a uh, Lovecraft short collection um, paperback that was uh, in the possession of my cousin's mother. You know, so I'm, I'm really going back here. <laughs> And um, she had all sorts of stuff, but she specifically had this Lovecraft Lovecraft anthology with um, the Call of Cthulhu was the, the main story. So that again, I must have been primary school age. So over here in the UK, I must have been eight or nine, maybe even ten. Um, I was baffled by the the whole thing, of course. It took a few years to to get my head around it. Yeah. Uh, Stephen King made more sense to me than uh, <laughs> the original weird fiction authors. Yeah, at that time, anyway. Yeah, I remember uh, my initial introduction to Lovecraft. I thought he was a director because I see all these uh, <laughs> these VHS right. tapes with his red lettering H.P. Lovecraft's The Unnameable, or you know, uh, yeah, all of those from beyond. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> the Stuart Gordon movies. Yeah, <laughs> that was the first time I actually. Uh, saw any of the uh, adaptations of his stuff, um, which again led me back to the shorts uh, from beyond specifically. And of course, the uh, 1985 reanimator, which uh, is still a good laugh today, I think. Yeah. Do you have a favorite uh, Lovecraftian film adaption? Um, I quite enjoyed um, The Color Out of Space, with the, you know, the Nick Cage movie. I, I thought that was. Um, it, it's one of the more accurate movies, and I did very much enjoy um, Banshee Chapter, which was much more of a. a I'm not familiar movie. with that one. Of course, for that one, um, Ted Levine, the guy from Silence, Silence of the Lambs, was in it. You know, the put the dog in the basket guy. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's a good, good, um, loosely based on From Beyond again, but with much uh, more kind of modern um, interpretation. I, yeah, I enjoyed that one. I recommend that one if you haven't come across that before. I have not. And uh, it's no surprise to me that you say uh, Color Out of Space because the director, Richard Stanley, is a basically a Lovecraft historian. And he was reading uh, or interviewed him. He read The Color Out of Space to his mother on his de her deathbed. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, interesting <laughs> story right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't he supposed to be doing um, the, the Dunwich Horror as well? Was, there, he was, was supposed to, to do a trilogy, but I don't think it's happening anymore. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah, I think it fell through. Yeah, oh well, oh well, yeah, have to wait for the next director to come along and give it a chance, right? So, if we zoom in on writing, what does your what does your typical writing process look like? I know it's kind of different each time, but are you a heavy outliner? Do you like to go with the flow and maybe edit later? Yeah, I, I suppose it depends on the, the project, and um, if it's um, if it's a first person situation um where a character is describing a series of events that happen to them and i'm not not worrying too much about dialogue then i can just kind of work and work and work and just kind of get into the the zone of that particular character and just thinking in those terms but if it's um a larger project with lots of characters and perhaps unfolds over a series of days then yeah i do like to think a little bit about the layout some headlights there, just uh, yeah, shining through, it, yeah. yeah, illuminating the room. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, again, it's all about um, the type of story. Again, I'm I'm, I'm chiefly working with um, short story, the short story medium, really, at the moment. Mm. Um, I've yet to stray into the novel arena because, again, it's very time consuming and don't really get a great deal of time to to write at the moment. Not as much as I would like, anyway. All right, so I wanted to ask you, you know, Ian, uh, there's a very thin line. They're kind of brothers, I guess, you know, weird tales, weird fiction, and sword and sorcery. So are you a fan of sword and sorcery yourself, or do you just lean towards the more horror side of things? No, no, I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm quite a fantasy fan as well, you know, hmm. particularly the, the Robert E. Howard sword and sorcery stuff. I mean, Conan, you know, I'd, I'd love to record some Conan stuff, but there are there's still questions regarding copyright that need to be resolved. Um, but yeah, I was a big fantasy fan. I, uh, I, again, read all the Tolkien stuff as a kid. Um, 
and of course your uh, C.S. Lewis works, Narnia, and all that kind of stuff. Um, even Stephen King's Dark Tower series kind of strays into the fantasy as well. I've been through all those as well. Um, but I do like that kind of sword and sorcery meets horror world. I think there's a uh, it's probably not as as established as it could be, particularly with like the modern slant that I think could Agreed. be applied. To. Yeah, and Howard Howard specifically is one of the only writers that I feel can match Lovecraft in his own mood, and when it comes to the Lovecraftian style. But I do prefer Howard's approach of I would rather cleave the head off of the monster than be driven <laughs> insane by <laughs> yeah yeah i'd have put up a fight didn't he yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah he's such a prolific author as well in, in the short life that he lived Un unbelievable mm. but yeah I, it's just there's a much more aggressive pace isn't there to to howard's works than lovecraft who likes to well i mean he, he can dwell on a point for half a century <laughs> and, but, um, it's worth it it's, yeah, it is. it's worth it in the end but um Pity he never attempted a, a full-blown novel. That would have been really interesting. I think the closest we got to that was, was Charles Dexter Ward. Mm, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So uh, what was the, what would you say was the catalyst? You kind of mentioned it, touched on it earlier. What was the catalyst for a horror babble in 2015, I believe? Well, I'd, um, I, I, as I said, I was in, um, I was in a, a band, um, towards the late 2000s, um, the early 2010s. And we, we we were quite serious about it at one point, but um, with four guys, you know, approaching 30 with various commitments, we didn't quite manage to to um, make the commitments necessary to see it through to, to the, the major leagues, if you will. So I decided to try my hand at some other things in the background. And one of those things was, well, I'm a big fan of weird fiction. I might try to record a couple of stories and see what happens. And, and that's all it was to begin with. It was just an experiment that kind of spiraled out of control a bit. <laughs> um, I, th I just still feel like that today. I don't really know what I'm doing half the time. Uh, but uh, we, I was lucky enough to get some support from uh, Rodrigo uh, Godinho over at Rumorg magazine. Oh, yeah. He was really supportive of what I was trying to do in the early days, and that kind of spurred me on. And Jennifer, my wife, and I, we, we decided to form something that would be a home for all that stuff rather than just trying to experiment with it on the side of other projects. Um, and again, for a couple of years, it was just a, a case of experimenting with the medium and trying to find a voice that would work that I would be comfortable with. I listen to some of those very early recordings now from 2015, 16, and I, I barely recognize the voice that I'm using. You know, it's, uh, I think it has evolved substantially since then, but um, yeah, it was, it was little more than an experiment that uh, kind of got out of hand. And yeah. that, that's the way I will uh, probably see it for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so do you also do the, the ambient music for horror babble as well? Since you, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the, occasionally I'll um, consult a, a musical friend who um, might be able to provide a, a, a different flavor to things that, um, that sometimes is, it takes a weight off me. But I, of course, I, as a musician first, I like to um, like to compose as often as I can get away with, really. Um, although it's a completely different ball game to writing songs. Mm. Um, but there's a there's a freedom. There's a freedom to ambient music that allows you to think outside the box, particularly if you have a, an interesting story to work with. Although nowadays I, I don't use as much music as I used to. I think I think I'm I'm, more, I'm happier nowadays to let the the uh, narration speak for itself, as it were. Right. So uh, take us behind the scenes a little bit. You know, what would you say is the most uh, difficult aspect of recording narrations that we might not expect? Um, well, pronunciation is probably yeah. <laughs> the uh, absolute number one. Um, so, uh, you know, that archaic language, sometimes it's impossible to find a pronunciation for a word and then you're really up against it because it's it's just a case of, well, I just have to do my best and hope that you know, I don't get too many negative comments. <laughs> um, um, on the flip side, the external noise is always a huge problem. You know, you might be in the middle of a wonderful take. And then of course a plane 
flies over and, and uh, ruins the whole thing. Um, the amount of time I have to stop start is probably ridiculous if you were to see it. It probably doubles the recording time. Um, and again, there are solutions to that long term, which Jen and I haven't found because we tend to move around a lot. So the idea of building a home studio is always in the back of our minds, but we keep moving from place to place and a bit nomadic in that respect. So uh, eventually we will stop and I'll build some sort of vocal booth that's more of a permanent solution to things. But has, yeah, has, has your own. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, sorry. After you. I was just going to ask, you know, outside of the the techni technical aspect of things, like maybe upgrading your microphone or something, has your own method to the recording changed? Yeah, there are certain things that I think make a, a huge difference. If I, if I work with a, a guest narrator or I'm, I'm working with even a family member that occasionally does some voice work, I will notice now how much mouth noise um, they produce, cause not doing it all the time. And I think you learn to hold everything in a, a specific way. You know, you, you're practically frozen still. The mouth is, is pre pretty much stripped of moisture. By the end of a session, you know, I need like about 10 of these. <laughs> um, and it's all about um, eliminating the mouth noise and the ambient noise of the room even, you know, every little shuffle. And and that, that I think, over the years has, has become quite a significant thing. But it... It does tend to change the way you pronounce certain words. Um, and even in my natural voice, which I'm speaking in right now, of course, it, I sometimes find myself um, struggling with words that I didn't struggle with before, which mm. is a strange thing because I spend so much time now speaking in a completely made-up voice. Um, <laughs> and I end up sometimes I wander into a shop and I think, hello, welcome. And, you know, I'm... I'm off I go into this this character, and I, I have to remember that these two uh, personas are completely separate. <laughs> right. So now it's become a, a variation of the the intro you have. But it was for the longest time, you know, the the statement of Randolph Carter. I would listen to your narration over and over again. It was just one of my personal favorite stories. So, what do you call recall about that recording specifically? Did you think the uh, Warren is dead was <laughs> going to become something? <laughs> I had no idea. I just, it, and I know that other people had focused in on that line before. You've got the, the I can't remember the name of the band that uh, produced the track, You Fool, Warren is Dead. But um, there's just something about that particular story. And you, you kind of become invested in this character of uh, Harley Warren. You, you know, you, and of course, the, the classic Lovecraft method of, of having him describe everything that he's seeing, but out of sight, you know, this guy's underground, you, you're hearing his description of, of everything that's going on below, and you can only imagine what he's going through. Um, so to get to that kind of, that line at the end, there's, there's, there's a certain energy to it that needs to be put into it. Um, and yeah, I just, I just, I thought with the intro, we, do, we just need something that, uh, encapsulates Lovecraft and encapsulates what we do at Horrorbub. And I think that line sums everything up. But uh, it is funny when you, you see those comments in, in, in below and people, What's, what the heck is that line from? <laughs> I've never heard that before. And they, then, of course, they have to go off and do the research and ultimately they find it. And it's... It's, uh, it's a good promotion. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun, I think. Which is which is the other thing with Horrorbub. I think a lot of, of these... Um, horror channels can probably take themselves a little bit too seriously in, in some instances. You know, there's a, I like to think that there's a, just, just a little touch of humor that accompanies a lot of what we do at Horror Bubble, which is a reflection of the people behind the scenes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this is, a, uh, this is some contemporary advice I see floating around about writing and uh, I posted a status to my social media, basically asking writing friends and readers, the advice being you should never start a story with dialogue because your reader has not yet established a voice for the speaker in their head. So I, I completely disagree. I disagree. But uh, what, do you, what do you think about that advice? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose, well, anything goes in the world of writing. I yeah. Think. Um. <laughs> 
I, I've I've seen everything now. I mean, in over the years, just just recording weird tale after weird tale after weird tale. You know, any any approach is there is. I've I've kind of come across it, and of course, there's all the contemporary writers that have, we can't touch here on horror bubble due to uh, copyright reasons and whatnot. But I think that um, in terms of storytelling, you know, th there is no rule book, in my personal opinion. Um, and the reason I say that is because I actually I'm quite comfortable working in this this zone where if I want to sell a particular concept to my listeners, I kind of think that they've had a an introduction to the types of stories that we're going to write. You know, in the weird fiction world, you you already have an idea of the kind of works that we're going to produce. So when I write something, it tends to fall into that category. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to think about what you said about uh, opening a story with dialogue and whether or not any of my stories do that. And I, I, I probably don't dwell on it that much to to think about that. Um, there are certain stories that involve certain characters that have been established. I don't know if you've um, come across any of our Peter Van Melsen stories with the uh, Paranormal Investigator. So after a while... You, you get to know the characters. So I think yeah. that's that, that's an exception to the rule. You can open a, a story with less background for any given character because you've had it in the previous story, haven't you? But yeah, I, I'm probably the worst person you could speak to with regards to uh, writing because I don't think about it too much. I just kind of jump in and hope for the best most of the time. Right. And just a sidebar, uh, just before I logged on, I, I think that whole conversation was snuffed because... Ramsey Campbell commented on the status and said, well, I like to start my stories with dialogue quite often. So they can argue with Ramsey Campbell if they there wish I'm go. not going to. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he, well, he knows his stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan, big fan of uh, Campbell's stuff, actually. Again, it's, uh, of course, being a, yeah, he's not from too far down the road, actually. He's over in Liverpool. So it's always interesting to see the, uh, the British interpretation of the, the mythos and, um, anything Lovecraftian because you automatically go off to New England and it's nice to to introduce it to to the home turf every now and then which is what I like to try and do as well yeah yeah so if you had to uh take a handful of weird tales to with you on a desert island which would they be <laughs> oh gosh yeah that's, that's, a, that's a tough one um I I, I the first thing that pops into my mind is I would probably um, I'd probably take a collection of uh, Smith stories first. Um, Clark Ashton Smith was probably my first um, introduction to weird fiction, which even predated the uh, Call of Cthulhu. Um, and again, it has a very specific style, I think, that's, again, distinctly different to Lovecraft and distinctly mm -hmm. different to Howard. And they're generally regarded as the big three, aren't they? Smith, Howard, and yeah. Lovecraft. Um, so I think I'd have to have um, my Out of Space and Time collection, which was the first Smith collection that I uh, got my hands on. And I'd probably choose some some more recent discoveries as well from the likes of um, Alison V. Harding, who is a, a female author that generally has been largely forgotten about. Um, but her... Her imagination was much more interesting than a lot of her peers at the time. It was still firing out the usual tropes, you know, your vampire stories, your werewolf stories and all the rest of it, outside of your cosmic horror that Lovecraft was putting out. But she she, she had quite the imagination. Mm. There were several stories by her that I would immediately want to have access to to remind me that there were, one, some wonderful female authors around at the time as well, and two, that they weren't necessarily just going over old ground either. Right. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we've we've touched on so many. Edmund Hamilton, another fabulous writer that, again, I think was was slightly underrated next to some of his peers with a very science fiction approach to, to weird fiction, which is always uh, refreshing. Have you um, have you read much Richard Tierney? I may be mispronouncing his last name. Tierney? No, I don't think so. I think just, you know, being familiar with his, your channel that you would really enjoy him. He's a contemporary of Ramsey Campbell and such. He wrote uh, Sorcery Against Caesar, which is like the Simon the Magus uh, tales that he does with uh, 
basically he takes the historical Simon the Magus and travels him around ancient Rome and fights all kind of Lovecraftian. It's basically Robert Sounds. Howard stuff. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. And anything that you would like to recommend, I'm I'm on it. Yeah, you would absolutely. Richard Tierney look into him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was <absolutely>. a <laughs> historian on Gnosticism, and uh, he blends a lot of real history with the Lovecraftian Robert Howard style fiction. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I am very open to that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think I think that's the problem with um, the contemporary authors is that because we we don't really have access to them as as, uh, as horror babble, it's. Um, spent most of my time in the 30s and the 40s and I tend to neglect uh, the more contemporary authors unless they're submitting works to us to, to potentially record um, which we do from time to time um, but yeah I'd like to I'd like to have a look at him um, I'll send you a link to some of his stuff yeah he just passed recently he was, I think it was 90 oh, okay yeah, yeah wow right was he an American author or I believe he was yeah mm-hmm mm -hmm. So uh, what are your personal favorite Lovecraft stories? Do you have any ones that you hold near to your heart? Um, mythos, I'm trying to think outside of the box. It's easy to list a, a bunch of um, mythos stories. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of In the Walls of Eryx, which takes place on Mars. With the, I don't know if you're familiar with that particular story. Um, I just like the concept. I think that um, it's, it's a later story of Lovecraft that kind of demonstrated perhaps some some uh, evolution in his uh, personal outlook, should we put it that way? Right. Um, um, Color out of space is, is again. I'm coming back to that, but that that was always um, a favorite of mine, and I know it was a favorite of his as well. But again, I think it's it's generally considered mythos, so I'm trying trying to avoid mentioning those. Um, but it, within the mythos, I would say possibly The Haunter of the Dark is a story that I come back to. Mm. And I particularly enjoy its connection to the two Robert Block stories that form a trilogy around it. Um, and of course, again, I'm going straight back to the uh, mythos stories here. So I'm trying to avoid those. Um, From Beyond is a just hugely influential story. Uh, as I mentioned with the Banshee chapter movie and um, the Stuart Gordon movie. Mm. Um, and, and of course, I think we've probably recorded 96, 97% of his works now. Um, but there's, there's the problem because I can't think of them all. Right. <laughs> <my head>. uh, <laughs> I've always been partial to beyond the wall of sleep just because I like the, the Gnosticism connections and stuff. And yeah. 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 It's, it's, I like the setting of that particular story as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and of course, then there's the whole um, dream world stories as well, um, which is the dream cycle stories. That's a completely different flavor to everything else. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I would like to have another go at uh, recording Dream Quest as well. I, I, I love the Randolph Carter series. I listen to your yeah. Randolph Carter series all the time. Wow, well, well, that's that's good to hear. I mean, I, I, they're so old, some of those recordings now that it's it's almost um, like I have to uh, avert my ears from it. But, um, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to revisit them anyway, just because I, I love the stories so much. Particularly, as you said, the, the Carter stories. Um, we, I, I always toyed with the idea of potentially writing an original story that kind of bookends the Carter series and give him some sort of. Um, an end to his journey. I mean, perhaps that's that's the beauty of it that there is no end to his journey. Yeah. I think uh, it could it could be a, a bad move. <laughs> Are you familiar with the unnameable film series with uh, that came out in the eighties? I believe like eighties. It was like no, the unnameable. I don't think so. Well, they had the unnameable and the unnameable to the statement of Randolph Carter and uh, the gentleman that plays Randolph Carter in both of those films. Uh, I'm actually friends with him. His name is Mark Stevenson, and I am writing a sort of fan fiction third installment to the film, and he's reprising the role as Carter. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, yeah. you can't argue with that, can you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the director then? Uh, Jean-Paul Olay. Right, I'm going to I'm have to dig dig a little bit more deeply to see if I can get my hands on that. It's out there. 
There are yeah. there are ways. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there are. Yeah, if there are, I'll find them. Yeah. Well, that sounds interesting. I'd be interested to see uh, what you come up with. Awesome. But of course, I'm going to have to familiarize myself with the first two installments. Right, and there's always with anything, you know, there's a toe in that line between Lovecraft's Carter, which is not exactly the same Carter that's in the film. So trying mm-hmm. to mix those two is interesting. Yeah, well, I'm color me intrigued. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds interesting. So you uh, you kind of touched on this earlier, but uh, you said you never saw the ghost. But uh, have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Yeah, oh yeah, many, many, many um, instances. You in in childhood, really, I would say that the majority of those strange things happened. But but yeah, I never, I never saw. Um, you know, to kind of preface the whole thing, never saw a physical apparition of any kind, but I did see um, strange things happen before my eyes that defied a logical explanation, which I do look back on every now and then and try to separate uh, fact from imagination, you know. Um, but I think um, some of those things have gone on to influence certain approaches to stories and things. Mm. But um whether you wanted a specific example, if you if you, if you want to share, if I'm I'm open. Um, just uh, one kind of a, a brief snippet. There was a friend of mine. Uh, again, I was a, a teenager at this point. A friend was visiting, and I'd always told him, "Oh, this house is haunted," you know, and he did, laughed it off as he did, a hardcore skeptic that he was. And there was just again, it, it seems like such a trivial thing, but we were sat in front of a television. And there was a jewelry box on top of this television. I would say it was two or three feet away from where we were sitting. And before our eyes, for absolutely no reason whatsoever, this jewelry box just kind of floated down from the TV and landed on my friend's lap. And um, in, in his kind of, we weren't really thinking about it in any serious way. And he, he went to put this jewelry box back and he realized that he couldn't reach from where he was sitting. And that was one of those moments where you think, well, that's certainly not a, a, a common day-to-day event, um, but it's not particularly the kind of thing you would associate with an aggressive poltergeist either. So it was. <laughs> so those are the sorts of things that I'm talking about. Just that counts. peculiar little events that defy explanation and uh, can't really be associated with anything. Yeah, that would definitely count. <laughs> Have yeah. you? So what would you say is the uh, best piece of writing advice you've received and who gave it to you? Oof, I don't think I've ever been um, given any writing advice, to be honest. <laughs> that uh, might no, be good. I am lying, actually. I am lying. Um, there was um, maybe about five or six years ago, I was um, I was approached by a, a management company in, in L.A. to potentially adapt one of my short stories. So we were looking at potentially adapting a 15, 20 minute story into an hour pilot for a TV show. Um, And this thing went through about five drafts. And, you know, I don't know if you've read the story or heard the story on the channel. It's called the fear experiment. I've seen it. I have not listened to it yet. Yeah. It it, it was, it was a, the idea that it might've been connected back to the Russian sleep experiment, you know, the famous creepypasta um, wasn't really written with that in mind, but I can I cannot see the uh, connection to it. Um, and yeah, the, the, I, I received lots of um, tips. It's more more from a kind of screenwriter's perspective. But I think the idea was um, it was, and if if, if this is a, if any use to anybody, I don't know. But it was the idea of establishing the entire plot before commencing to write something that, that needs to fit into a particular category. So if, you, if you're writing a, a screenplay that's an hour in length, then it can be a really wasteful period of time to keep attempting to write the thing before you've actually properly mapped it out. Um, so, for example, having a, an end that um, corresponds with the beginning and all these sorts of things. Um, regular beats but I, I, I suppose I don't tend to follow this stuff with my uh, my, my short stories. That's the, that's the difference. I can see how it would apply to um, a TV show. Right. Now you would need to to engage the audience with with an interesting 
bit of exposition every five minutes. But I, I feel like that's that's dumbing it down for the audience personally, which is probably why um, this this didn't take off. COVID is largely to blame as well for for the project running out of steam. But um, yeah, I, I think I, I would say that to anybody. You know, map mm. out your project um, and flesh out your characters in advance. I think that's another a thing that I've learned from listening to interviews with with directors and writers that I respect is to get to know your character, even if that backstory doesn't make it into the story that you write in. If you know that character inside out, it's much easier to give that character a uh, personality. And I, I have stuck to that. With um, particularly with the uh, Peter Van Nelson series, I like to make sure everybody has a specific look. Um, you know, the if, if if I say that they were such and such an age in one story, they need to have aged appropriately for the next one. Um, all those little details that to make up a real person, and I think that can make a big difference to the flow of a story. Mm. So the uh, the management company did they find you via your channel and reach out that way? They did, yeah. That's cool, um, man. It, yeah, it, it was. It was quite exciting at the time. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't really get anything off the ground, but um, it did make me realize that, of course, there are people that, that uh, are out there looking to develop stories, and, and YouTube has become a pretty pretty good resource for that kind of thing. Yeah. So I guess just to put a bow here on everything, Ian, or what's on the horizon for you? Can you share anything without getting in trouble? Um, well, I'd only be getting in trouble with myself, so uh, <laughs> I suppose that's not too bad. Um, I'm, I'm planning a, a, a few new um, re-recordings. I'm, I'm going to be doing a new take on uh, The Shadow of Rensmith. That's uh, imminent. Um, I am outlining my first novel at last, oh. um, which is going to um, continue the, the, the Peter Van Melsen universe. Um, and depending on how that goes, I'll... Uh, I'll follow up with subsequent novels, potentially standalone novels as well. But uh, I, I, I quite like writing that character. It's a bit, it's a bit quirky. It's a bit fun. Mm. Um, so I'm trying to bring all that in the new year. Um, there's potentially an animated Lovecraft short as well on the cards, which again I don't want to drop our illustrator in uh, muddy waters by talking about it. But um, understood. We, we, we're working on the outsider at the moment. Um, so we, we, we're going to see if we can pull something off in terms of a very short, condensed, animated um, short. To to repeat myself, um, so yeah, I'm trying to get as many things in next year as possible, but to um, keep moving in new directions if possible, and um, try to keep audio exciting if, if if that's a possible thing. There's there's a couple more audio dramas on the cards as well. I'm hoping to. Um, do do many more full cast productions because we've not really experimented with that too much. It's just a logistic thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, logistical thing. Um, like a, uh, it's just, I'd say it's Lovecraft in space. Um, to put it that way, but that that just sounds. It sounds like a setup for a, a poor comedy skit, doesn't it? <laughs> Lovecraft in space, like Jason Ten or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, Jason, Jason X. Yeah, Jason. That's the one. Yeah, <laughs> it was ridiculous, fun, but absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Well, Ian, I'm a big fan of what you do, man. Uh, again, thank you for uh, giving me some of your time here. I had a pleasure chatting with you. No, I appreciate it. Um, as you can probably tell, I don't do this very often, and uh, I wouldn't like to listen back to it straight away. I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> It'll be fine. Trust me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I appreciate you uh, taking your time to uh, to to talk to me. For me, and well, you, you enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll send you a link once I get this nice and pretty. Awesome. Well, thanks, Justin. All the best to you, and I will speak to you again soon, hopefully. Yes, well, yes, sir. You as well. See you later. Take care. <laughs> bye, bye then. <laughs>